Energy production is responsible for the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Moving to more renewable energy production is crucial, but what does that look like? Today I'm meeting with Professor Alan Brent from the School of Engineering and Computer Science who will share with us some untapped locations for energy production and show us how we can move to a cleaner, greener future. So Alan, here we are at Makara Wind Farm, a great place to be talking about global energy demand. In climate change, energy is a big deal, but just globally, how much of uh, greenhouse gas emissions does energy contribute? The energy sector is by far the most important uh, for, from a climate change perspective or a carbon emissions perspective. You know, up to 80% of it can be associated with carbon emissions. How much in the New Zealand context is energy contributing to our greenhouse gases? We, we think about energy and we think about electricity, but there's much more to it. If you think from a primary energy consumption perspective, we're still importing a lot of oil. And we're still using some coal uh, in, in our economy. And there's natural gas, uh, obviously, and that's where, that's where all the, the carbon emissions are, are really coming from. Our challenge is, as we take those other parts of the economy and shift them to, to more electricity, we need to significantly increase our generation capacity in the country. Obviously we've got a need to grow electricity demand as more transport and industry moves away from fossil fuels into electricity. Historically, we've generated our electricity from big power plants, whether they're hydroelectric stations, big geothermal plants, or even wind farms like this, we tend to do them on a big scale. Do you see that as the future of electricity production in New Zealand? The challenges that, that, that we face is you have significant losses if you're generating the power far away from where, where the demand is. So in our economy, our biggest the demand is obviously uh, up in Auckland and in our uh, bigger cities. And the majority of our hydropower generating capacity is all sitting on the South Island. And so what we're seeing globally is that we're moving away from this, what we call a centralised, big utility scale generation to more distributed, smaller scale generation. And uh, important on that is we're moving away from the whole notion of, of uh, consumers to prosumers because everybody in the economy could be generating electricity and supplying that into the, into the grid. Can I just dig into that a little bit as to what you mean by uh, what is a prosumer? So I think about any consumer, it might be uh, us as residential household owners or um, commercial entities uh, or uh, even industrial complexes or uh, manufacturing facilities as, as an example. At the moment they're consumers, they, electricity is flowing from our generation to, uh, to supply those energy services that they, they need. But there's nothing that's stopping them from actually starting to generate electricity themselves and pushing those electrons back into the grid. And that means they also become producers and hence we have the, the, the new concept of uh, a prosumer. So with decentralised systems, whereabouts could we be, be seeing these crop up? We see the agricultural sector start playing a bigger role within the energy sector because of the dual land use possibilities. So what we've seen globally and, and what's starting to be investigated in the New Zealand context is to say, well, if we have farmland and if we look at farmland over here, especially if you have more fatter areas, there's no reason that you can do sheep farming or your dairy farming below PV panels. In fact, it has been shown, especially in the summer months, to be better for the livestock uh, because of heat stress uh, and so on. The animals have the additional benefit of the shade. A lot of crop has been shown to grow pretty well under solar PV panels. We have this opportunity of dual land use in, in New Zealand where we can do both agricultural production and energy produ production on the same, uh, same uh, piece of land. And we already see that with wind farms, right? I mean, after we've constructed the, the wind farms, the agricultural activities are ongoing. This is a good example of where we can have a combination, or as we said, a hybrid of, of bioenergy, solar energy, and obviously we're standing here wind farms, so the wind resource would be good. So if we didn't have the wind farm around here, it's easy to put up a few hundred kilowatts of of small wind turbines. So obviously New Zealand has a lot of agricultural land. Do you see that given that amount of land we could we could easily meet our future energy demands as we as we electrify more of our, our energy system that that we've got enough space to, to be able to build what we need? Yeah, uh, absolutely. We've, we've done the analysis in terms of, and NIWA has done the analysis in terms of the resource that we have available on our land but also the offshore 
uh, we were looking at, at wind farms offshore. Obviously, that's it's better from a, from a wind resource uh, utilization perspective. If you combine all of those resources that we have, there's absolutely no doubt that we could supply all of our needs that, that we require to transition to a net zero carbon uh, economy by 2050. Are there examples around Wellington where this more localised energy production is happening? For a number of years we've, we've seen the system operating in Matu Island, uh, or Soms Island in the, in the harbour, and I think that's a very good spot to go and, and check out. From the Makara wind farms on the west coast of Wellington City, we're off to Machu Soms Island. Located in the middle of Te Whanganui Atara Wellington Harbour, this is an incredible place to visit and just a short boat ride from our Pipitea campus. Machu Soames Island is a predator-free scientific reserve. It is also a historic reserve with a rich multicultural history. Machu Soames Island belongs to local iwi Taranaki Whanui following a treaty settlement. It is governed by a kaitiaki board and managed by the Department of Conservation. All right, so Alan, here we are on beautiful Machu Soames Island. Can you tell us about the energy systems that we've got at play here? We have a six kilowatt wind turbine here. This seems like a relatively small turbine compared to the ones we saw out at Makara. Yeah. How much could this supply? But obviously it's a little island here. It's doing the, the bulk of the power generation yeah. for the island, but in a wider community setting, a turbine this big would be how many houses? Think about it for, in terms of your kettle, right? Your kettle is typically about two kilowatts. So think about your kettle boiling for three hours. That's what this would do. But a typical household, you would be running about two kilowatts in a day. It's enough power to, to, for, for this community for probably two or three days. To complement our uh, six kilowatt tu wind turbine, on a roof space over there, we have just under four kilowatts of, of conventional solar PV panels. So more or less uh, it's a, it's a similar size than we have with the wind turbine. Uh, to complement it, so but that's very site specific. We need to evaluate those, those solar and the wind resources, look over an entire year based on what the resource would be over a typical year and thinking about our load profile, that then determines the size of battery we need. And that all happens uh, in, in a room, room over here where we have the conventional batteries storing that energy, but very importantly as well as we have the inverter. Our appliances at home uses AC. Uh, but the wind turbine and the solar PV uh, panels uh, supply DC cu current. We also have the hydrogen electrolyzer. As we see, the electricity is supplied into our storage, conventional storage and inverters, but it also hooks up to the electrolyzer. And what the electrolyzer basically does electrolytically takes our water molecules, which all know is H2O, and it splits that into hydrogen H2 and oxygen O2, which is released in, in, into the air. Uh, that hydrogen is uh, then piped to this storage. We under, uh, underground here we have a just a conventional uh, storage tank, but effectively that's a battery, right? So this is stored uh, until such time as we need it. Now, a normal community, we might take that hydrogen, very similar to the, to the electrolyzer, we call it the fuel cell. We take that hydrogen uh, in a fuel cell that combines with oxygen out of the air, releases water vapor into the atmosphere, and we get electricity. Uh, so it, it's very similar to, to conventional battery. But what we have on the island here is they're not using it for electricity generation. Um, inside, inside the building here, they have a uh, just a normal hot, uh, hot water heater. So like we have a gas, a gas water heater in, in some of our homes. They're supplying the, or servicing that, that water heater with, with hydrogen gas. And so they're burning the hydrogen to they're heat burning, the water? Yeah or burning it in your barbecue, for example. Or you could burn, they have a barbecue in here. Unfortunately, we don't have time to barbecue in here, but <laughs> yeah, we could roll out the barbie and just, just, just run out of hydrogen. Obviously, the island here provides us a great example of how we can deliver a renewable future, but it's a very small scale here on the island. What, what lessons can we take from this for the rest of the country and potentially the rest of the world? to kind of scale it up and, and do this on a, a, at a bigger picture. Even though this is, this is quite a small scale, you can think about communities that are connected to one another. So if, if each community had this kind of system operating independently but connected to the next community, you can think about this island, maybe you're not consuming all of the, all, all of the energy at one time, 
You could be selling it or moving that, those electrons to, to the next community. And so that's what we're going to see in, in, the, in the future, much more diversity in terms of using the resources that we have available in, within our community, uh, but being connected. And so there's a connection between all these different microgrids, utilizing the resources that they have to their, their disposal in an efficient way, uh, makes for an overall more resilient system that's totally decarbonized. All right, Alan, thanks so much for explaining all those systems on the island here. Yes, yeah, so my pleasure, Andrew. So, uh, Let's go and catch our ferry back to the mainland. Absolutely. So we're seeing that here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we've got lots of opportunity to really boost our renewable energy power generation. We can take our agricultural land and make that a much more productive energy generating source and we can have local communities building their resilience and generating their own power through microgrids. We just need to start transitioning to that future, a clean green future.